Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me here on the Sales, Startups and Side Hustles podcast as we launch and talk to entrepreneurs. We talk to founders, we talk to startup entrepreneurs and hustlers, those who are making incredible things happen around the world. And to that end, we have a special guest today who is going to rock your world. Her story is incredible from retail sales management all the way through to starting magazines, subscriber newsletters with tens of thousands of followers. She's one of LinkedIn's major influencers with over 70,000 people following her every move on LinkedIn. She's a personal branding specialist. She has come from being the stage queen and now is the founder and director of her own company. She is none other than Mary Henderson, and it is a huge pleasure to have you on the show. Mary, thank you so much for joining us. Oh my God, well, what an introduction, but I'm actually really excited to be here myself. So, you know, it works both ways. It's so great to have you. Now, I, I've been doing a little bit of uh, research on you and finding out you're no stranger to podcasts. You've been on podcasts, you've been on YouTube interviews, you've, you've been on stages all around the world. Um, how did this all happen for you? Actually, let me start with a better question. You went from straight out of school, you went to, you went down the, the musical arts theatre path uh, I read somewhere that that your parents weren't happy about that. So you you challenged that. You broke out of it. You went into psychology. You got into retail and management and sales and territory management. And now you run business coaching and professional branding for businesses and entrepreneurs around the world. This seems like an incredible journey. How did you go from sort of out of school and in that space and and getting into then sales and business and all of those kind of territories? I'm going to start the question back to front, you sure. know, and the reason I'm going to do that, because I think it'll put everything into context. Back to front is what do I stand for today? And what mm. I stand for today is making sure that I teach people how to pursue and fulfill their purpose and mission. That is my mm. absolute stance. So it's amazing when you look back to front because then you start to realize and you connect all the dots and you're like, everything was divinely orchestrated for mm. me to actually be doing what I'm doing today. So my wow. life started, you know, with my parents who are migrants and um, I grew up in a very uh, working class family uh, my parents believed that, you know, that hard work and getting a degree was the only way to success. But I was gifted. You know, I had a voice. I was very talented at singing. My parents invested a lot of time and money in, in all of the performing arts, you know, things that I wanted to be involved in. Um, and I mean, I went a long way. But when it came, you know, that, that moment when I had to choose my direction and my path in life, I said to my parents, I want to go to the College of Arts. It's all I want to do. My mum was like, are you kidding? <laughs> like we didn't migrate to Australia for you to be standing on a stage and singing. Like that's not a career. You need to be a doctor or a lawyer or, or an architect. That's a career. And and as a 16-year-old, I thought, oh, my God, my, my dreams are crushed. Wow. And that was a really massive, that was actually trauma for me. Mm. And that's how I received that, that messaging, which, wow. by the way, I carried that trauma for a very long time because I didn't know how to process it. Um, but the thing is, well, that none of that went to waste because looking back now, I, was, I don't think I was ever meant to be a singer. What I believe I was meant to do was understand the power of voice. And this is really such the, this is the epicenter of the work that I do. So it's ironic that it's it, because I, because I say to people, understand what your gift is and channel that any way you can. The talent can change. Don't worry about the talent. The talent's always, you can apply the gift to any talent, but it's the gift that I think we need to hold on to and we need to nurture. So that's kind of the backdrop as to wow. how I start my, my journey as a on stage but nothing's changed. You know, the voice is still the epicenter of what I do. I love that. And and you can see with um, my business partner, my friend uh, gave me the sign, this neon sign that uh, forms my backing now, which just says you have magic in you. It's it's yeah. the message I think that you're resonating right now, which is just so music to my ears. Um, tell me about the gift. When you're talking to an entrepreneur, you just mentioned there, you have the gift, the talent can change, but the gift yes. stays with you. Tell me about that. What's What's your thoughts there? I think that we as a society have not been taught from the school system 
how to unpack our natural state of being. Mm. We're all looking for answers outside of us. We're all looking to be like somebody else, to aspire to be like somebody else. And whilst I love the Gary V's, the Oprah's, all of the influencers, I like to watch them. I don't want to be them. But so many people want to be like that. And that is because we've never been taught how to take a step back, go inside and ask some pretty deep questions. Who am I? What are my natural gifts? What do I look like in my natural state of being? What do I love? What am I passionate about? What am I good at? Mm. And I think that we have to stop looking outside and start going inside because when I work with people, that's my first stop. I make people look at themselves and love themselves. This is all I've got. This is your inventory. I can't I can't help you be like Oprah. I don't know what Oprah's natural state of beingness is. I don't know what her 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 gifts are, her talents are, her core values, her abilities, her attributes, her traits. I have no idea, but I know what you have. And that's what we have to work with. And we have to fall in love with that. I call that the soul print. That's what I call that. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. I think there's there's so many people, you and I are, are doing the same work with entrepreneurs, helping them understand that this gift that you're mentioning is something that they have. It's unique to them. It's something that nobody else can do the way that they do it. And and it's yes. it's that gift that we we want to explore with entrepreneurs and help people understand what makes it. How do you how do you work with people that are finding that concept hard. For so many years, they've been in the same light as yourself, as we just mentioned, they've been beaten in the academic path that you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. As Jay, Jay said, Shetty said, it's it, you have to be one of those academic pathways. Um, you have to be, you have to get a job. You have to, you know, march the nine to five line. Um, what do you say to people that are tired of that, but they don't know what to do? Uh, I, you know, try and deconstruct societal ideologies as much as possible mm -hmm. and and use a language to share that knowledge with people it's almost like i want to pull the wool over your out of your eyes and make you see who you truly are and i think that because we've been brainwashed to believe certain things to fear certain things our society has done an amazing job at making most of us follow this pathway that essentially ends in a dead end. Mm. But the thing is, well, that I want to say this, and, and you probably will, will, will totally resonate with this. I find it ironic that, and you know this because you speak to entrepreneurs, they all kind of have the same ideas of when it comes to fear. What if it doesn't work out? What if I don't get clients? What if I fail? What if, what if? And I find it amazing, no matter who I work with, what religion they come from, what color their skin is, what part of the world they're from, what is their first language, that ideology and that, that mindset is the same across the board. Now, I always say to my clients, that's 99% of the world are thinking exactly like you. Now, we have to question that and say, mm, that's interesting. Why are the 1% not thinking like that? You're looking over here. The 1% are looking over here. So you've got to question that. You have to ask yourself, what are the 1% thinking that the 99% are not thinking? Well, let me tell you, it's very easy. The 1% have challenged societal ideologies. They haven't bought into the systems that we've bought into. Go to school, get an education, you get a degree, go to university, you're going to be a good little girl, you know, a great citizen. And I'm saying, yes, but I don't really want to be a part of that system because that system, I haven't really seen how it served the, the majority of the population. Everyone's still... Uh, you know, uh, 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 frustrated, people are not fulfilled, they're overweight, they're unhealthy, they're losing their job, they can't get a new job. There's all these problems. They hate so job. I'm saying, yeah. yes, they hate you, their job, and they're in a job for the sake of, oh, I've got bills, I've got a family, mm. blah, 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 all the same reasons again. So for me, when I can challenge societal ideologies and feel really comfortable doing that, mm. I'm already detach from the 99% because I'm going through a process of unlearning what I've learned and mm. we have to get comfortable with that. So I think like looking at your, looking at your academic um, 
history there when you were um, studying studying a major in psychology at uni yes. and talking now about the fear that is prevalent in every entrepreneur and every non-entrepreneur in every human let's go with that there's there's those fundamental fears of am i going to be good enough am i going to make it what happens if how do you how do you think entrepreneurs deal with that differently than i guess people who are not willing to to look at those options well i think that there's two type of entrepreneurs first and foremost there's the people that have got side hustles that call themselves entrepreneurs and that mm -hmm. to me is not entrepreneurship then there's the entrepreneurs who are the risk takers who say you know what I'm prepared to lose everything and fail as much as I possibly can, but know that I actually pursued my path. That's the entrepreneur that I'm talking to. Because mm. the thing is that if we don't have that 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 notion that I can fail abysmally and I can lose everything, but I'm okay with that, that's the start of the journey for entrepreneurship from my standpoint. And you know, and and I've been down, this is my third startup. You know, I've had two tech startups before that. And that was my ideology. It was like, I'm just going to, I don't care if I fail and I don't care if I lose everything, but I need to do this. Mm. So not trying so, is actually failing more. Th exactly. That's exactly right. But the thing is that I feel that with entrepreneurs, that the true entrepreneurs, we kind of think like that, you know, yeah. and we do, we're risk takers. We're okay with being uncomfortable and it's not foreign to me. I'm not afraid of failure. I don't care what people say. I am here to fulfill my purpose and mission. But I also believe, Walt, that entrepreneurs need to belong to other people like us so we can feed off one another, support mm. one another, advocate for one another. Because I don't think that, I think that doing entrepreneurship on your own is very, very dangerous yeah. and it's very, very lonely. And so even just doing these type of podcast type of scenarios is very powerful because here we are, you and I, for the next 35 minutes, bouncing off one another, you know, building relationships, collaborating in some shape or form, but I'm never going to forget you. You're always going to be at the back of my mind or front of mind mm. or top of mind, you know, and vice versa. So I feel that with true entrepreneurship, we do need to find a place that we can belong to to actually just just bounce off ideas because it is a lonely world when you go down the true path of entrepreneurship. So it's interesting, you know, we're, we're talking about the numbers there. We're saying, you know, the 1%, the 99%. And looking at that lonely journey, um, even just tapping into resources like this, getting hold of podcasts, being being a subscriber to your newsletters, which congratulations, by the way, looks incredible. The being connected with information from external sources is such an important piece because you genuinely do feel like you're on your own. I've, I've done the mental struggle thing. You know, we had a business go under and, and um, nearly cost me my life and my family, you know, a father and a husband. Um, that was a terrible, terrible time. And uh, that mental health space for, for entrepreneurs is a dangerous one. But for anybody that's listening, if you're on the treadmill or you're in the car, the the actual community of entrepreneurs are connected by a by a I don't know an energy. Even if you're not in a yes. in a membership, even if you're not standing next to each other in a coffee shop, there's an energy between us that always recognizes who you are, what you're doing, how you're creating, and tapping into that. I think is is a huge thing. So, Mary, as um as you're developing this out, and and if I can dive into the newsletter just for a second, wow, for a start, like. In today's day and age, we've all got too many things that we're subscribed to. There's too much notifications in your inbox and on your phone. To build a newsletter up to nearly 10,000 um, subscribers as I'm recording this, and you're only three episodes in, which is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Not only that, to have 70,000 people following you on LinkedIn, what you're creating there is a community uh, and you're leading that community in, in an incredible way. How are you... Um, how are you writing that? How are you connecting with your audience using what you're doing with your Mary Henderson coaching and putting that into a, into a digestible format? What's driving you to, to have that voice into the community? I decided this year, well, that I was sick and tired of just noise, you know, these self-proclaimed influencers and especially on LinkedIn, actually, mm. it's the same thing over and over again, rinse and repeat, do this to get that, do this to get that. And it's all based on individual, on an individualized experience, which I totally appreciate. But to me, well, you know, being a, uh, uh, calling yourself an, intro, uh, an entrepreneur and selling LinkedIn services to me is not entrepreneurship. That's just a job, you know? So 
what I wanted to do this year was I wanted to put the light on wisdom. That's where I'm going. I want to, I want to make people see that they are sitting on a gold mine called wisdom currency. That is the highest form of currency that exists in the world. Knowledge and information is not currency. It's just filling up a lot of empty holes in your soul. But if you don't understand that knowledge and you haven't experienced that knowledge, what is it? It's just more noise, right? Mm -hmm. It's just being able to, to articulate somebody else's you know, experience and somebody else's voice through your words, but really you're copying and pasting. No, what I want is I want to show people, look, I'm going to put a light on wisdom and everything that I share with you comes from that place. It doesn't come from a place of reading two or three books, attending a weekend seminar and getting a certification and calling myself an expert. I don't even call myself an expert. I call myself a specialist, but I'm I don't call myself an expert. Why? Because I'm 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 a student of life. I'm mm. always always learning. So wisdom is very interesting because there's two layers of wisdom from where I stand. The first the first layer is your 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 experienced knowledge and skill set okay and that's your professional background so when you've experienced that knowledge and you understand that knowledge that converts to wisdom that's one layer but then there's another layer and that's what i call your universal principles these this is your hero's journey this is you going in and experiencing life as you used the word beautifully before, energetically, these are these are, this is this is a whole different layer of wisdom because it doesn't come from a book; it comes just from being. Mm. And when you converge those two together, you can bring a new layer of 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 knowledge to the table that people can take. And and I'm not pushing my ideology on anyone. I'm just saying here's a different perspective. You know, and this is my perspective. This is how I've experienced it because I don't want to fit in to what everybody else is doing. I'm not interested in that. I don't need the vanity metrics. I don't need the, the, the million followers to validate who I am. I already know who I am. And I think that's the starting point. And what I say to all my clients, if you don't show up as knowing that you're already an authority, then chasing and being seen as an authority is very different to showing up and saying, I'm already the authority. I don't need the validation. You can take it or you can leave it because everything I give you is from my experience. So that newsletter that you're reading is actually a transcription of my weekly live show, uh, which is on LinkedIn, which I stream on LinkedIn. And I use that same messaging, you know, in voice, and in 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 a written format. Again, I'm going to just say this because this is so powerful. The two most powerful instruments that we have been given as humans is our voice and our hands. We write with our hands. We speak with our voice. That's energetically highly charged, and how we use it is entirely up to us. So I've chosen to use my two instruments, you know, simultaneously. And using messaging that is a hundred percent aligned. So as people are coming to you, Mary, though, so you're you're a leader. I'm going to absolutely use that word um, well. You are a leader in helping specifically coaches and consultants find their voice, find their messaging, and find their branding. As people are coming to you, do you often have to uh, do you? Have help them find that or do they already know it and then they need you to help them broadcast it in a, in a larger forum? Most people that I work with have no idea that they're already sitting on a gold mine. And mm. I show people, I say, here's, let's convert all of your experience into hours and let's multiply that by $100 an hour. Let's just give it a value. You're already sitting on three, $4 million worth of intellectual currency already. That's the starting point. Where I think I help a lot of people, 99.99% .99 of the people I work with is I can organize all of their life experience, professional and personal, and merge that together to create a solution, okay? And because I come from a software, a tech background, and I owned my own software company for many years, I understand 
how to create data points. I understand frameworking. You know, I've, my company built algorithms. I get how to think like that. So for me, organizing that information is so critical because then we arrive at the complex problem that you can solve and we organize that information into a solution that can be delivered in multiple different ways. Nice. I like it. So one of the things that you said there, Mary, was that you said, if you don't show up as an authority, it's never going to be something that you can chase and achieve. How do you, how do you work with people that say, yeah, but Mary, I'm not really sure if I am an authority. I think that the thing that I try and get across to people is that if you have that attitude that I don't know if I'm an authority, well, first of all, let me just backtrack. First of all, I don't work with people that are not industry experts. So that's the first thing. So there's no one that I work with will ever say that because they're already come from a background where they can they they can prove to me that they are an industry expert. For me, well, it's too difficult to package somebody that wants to be famous for being famous. So no. that's not my tribe at all. So I do work only with industry experts. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when people get really freaked out because they have to put themselves out there, they already know that that's what they're in for. Otherwise, I can't, the only other way that you can generate leads and sales is going down the pay to play path. So mm. which one is it? You want to spend 10 grand and get leads and never and you don't put yourself out there? Or do you want to learn how to actually start a dialogue with your target audience, how to pull them in, learn, you know, desire-based marketing strategies, you know, become a brilliant marketer, not a brilliant salesperson. Sales is the effect of brilliant marketing. So I try and, and, and I think that with me, because I'm an end-to-end -end solution and we wrap an entire sales and marketing strategy around their area of specialization, I try and make it as easy as possible for people to just get really comfortable in putting themselves out there. And I think that once you get a taste of it and you can see that, you know, it's going down the right path, I think that a lot of people just feel like, yep, this is where I want to be. I, I do want, because I think you've got to decide first and foremost, do I want to create impact? Do I want to bring my area of specialization into the world? Um, and serve on a mass scale? Or do I want to be super, super, super tight and little, mm. and then I'm not going to be the right person for you? Because I do promote the idea of you've got to use your voice and you've got to use your hands. I love it. So I, as you mentioned, there's two different types of entrepreneurs. And um, you mentioned your your ideal audience are not the side hustles on the weekend, you know, selling stuff on eBay kind of kind of people. Your 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 clients are, are the ones that are starting something big and making, and you used a really important word there, impact. And I feel yes. like I feel like this is the defining moment for an entrepreneur that says, I want to do this for the rest of my life. This is the thing, whatever that thing is, this is the thing that I just have been in my soul trying to find, as you, you you called it your soul print before. Do you see that transformation in entrepreneurs? And let me load that question up a little bit. I think I think a lot of people start up with the sell stuff on eBay on the weekends kind of stuff or whatever they whatever they do to get kind of that initial bug, that traction or or whatever it is to pay some, bring some money in. There's a, there's a moment, there's a pivotal moment where that belief goes, whoa, this, do you see that happen as a transformation with, with people in your group? I think that there are two, again, there's also another layer with this whole entrepreneurship, you know, uh, individual, there's the entrepreneur that's chasing success. And then there's the entrepreneur who's chasing their purpose and mission. Mm. And they're two different entrepreneurs. Mm. One is chasing either a quick fix, let's make a buck, you know, like I'm on the way, you know, I'm going to create success. I'm going to do what I need to do, um, scale, sell, move on. But then there's the other one that says, I am on a mission. I, I must pursue this purpose and this mission because this is my soul print. I must do this. Mm. That, that's it's a different that's game. my trial. A completely different game. And in, in this is me. You know, I am on a mission. You know, this is why I talk about 
the wisdom currency so much. This is new language, Walt. You know, when I talk about wisdom currency, people are like, oh, yeah, that's nice. And I'm like, do you actually understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, and I think that we are heading into the wisdom economy. We will get there. There's no doubt about that because information will be just, it, it, it's too much to fathom. Already. You know, all the different ideologies, you know, the different angles, do this, do this, and nothing works. So I'm saying, look, push that aside. It's all lovely and great, but you got to come from a place. That's why I say you've got to start with knowing you're an authority first and foremost, because then you make the decision. Am I, chase, am I chasing a job? Am I buying, am I creating a job for myself? Am I creating, a, am I chasing success or am I chasing purpose and mission? And there's three different types of people. Uh, and typically for me, it's the purpose and mission. So on this, like, and again, you know, focusing on your um, your expertise there, which again, I use the word leader very, very easily. Um, focusing on the people that have a purpose and a mission. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. They're coming to you saying, help me define this. Now, one of the things that I'm really super impressed with, Mary, is that you are a personal branding expert and nobody does it better than you. Honestly, when when I'm doing my research for uh, for podcast guests, for people coming on the show, finding your personal brand was as easy as drinking a glass of water. Your personal branding is rich. It's on every platform. Your message is consistent. You've led the way in, I guess, what you're you're working with people to teach. So this might seem like a stupid question, but I'm going to ask you, why is personal branding important? I think when I think of personal branding, it's not from the standpoint of, how famous am I going to be on a social media platform? Mm. I think for me, again, it comes back to that knowing that I'm already the authority and I want people, I want to be able to serve people and provide people my knowledge and my wisdom to solve a problem that they may be experiencing. So from, for, from my standpoint, it actually has nothing to do with fame. It's just that I marry am the business to begin with, and I, Mary, bring 23 years of knowledge, wisdom, skill set, abilities to the table, and I, Mary, know how to package you inside out, literally inside out. And that, for me, is my definition of personal branding. And, 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 and we spoke about this before, but it's knowing who I am in my natural state of being mm. because authenticity is that. How many personal branding experts are on social media saying, you have to be authentic? How can I be authentic? I'm already authentic. Have you not checked that everyone's got their own authentic DNA print? Like, what are you talking about? So I'm very pragmatic. I'm very logical, but I'm also very open-minded. I understand that, you know, that a personal branding can seem a little like uh, make it till you uh, fake it till you make it type of a concept. But I don't see it from that perspective. I see it as how do I package you as a as a product? How do you actually put yourself out there and pull the right audience in that say, I need Walt. I've got to speak to him because he's got exactly what I want. I'm connecting with him on a much, much, much deeper layer. So personal branding on its own is meaningless. Personal branding, when you connect it with what you do, who you can serve and what you can absolutely promise based on outcomes, results and transformation. Now you're talking to me. Now you've got breadth and depth. So I think that we've got to stop this ideology around personal branding that, oh, you need a personal brand on LinkedIn. You actually don't need a personal brand on LinkedIn. What you need is brilliant messaging on LinkedIn to be seen as the go-to brand for that area of specialization. That's pretty simple. And I think that that's what we've got to focus on rather than, you know, investing on in tone and voice and colors and branding and logos, all of that's important. But if your messaging is out of alignment, good luck. <laughs> you'll never be, you'll never break through. I think the, I think the concept of a personal brand has been um, uh, bastardized to use a better word. Yeah. People, people yes. have sold a personal branding hack and it's, you know, a new logo and a headshot and a whatever. That's, that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about genuinely finding your method of authentically being the voice in the space that you are. And 
To the people that might say, well, why do I need that? Here's the thing. If you're the, if you want to stay small, you don't. Really, you don't. If you just want to keep plugging away at what you're doing, then you don't need a personal brand. But if you genuinely want to take that level up, if you want to hit that mission and purpose, then you're going to need to be seen in the marketplace the right way. Now, if you're an introvert, right? If you're the, um, I, I run a software company as well. So if you're the, you know, I just want to code all day and, you know, that kind of stuff. If you're the business owner and that's your space, there's going to be a day when you're going to need to get publicity if you truly want that coverage. And that's why this personal branding message is such an important thing. So Mary, as people are coming in, and, and again, I want to talk to the coaches and the consultants just for a moment. So people who own a business and want to make an impact via the delivery of coaching and consulting, which is which is your, uh, your key audience there. Um, when they're coming into personal branding, how do they make sure that they are defining themselves in a crowded marketplace? How do they make sure that they are the one that people see and say, I want to work with you? Well, what comes back to what we were saying before, it's really understanding who am I in my natural state of being. In fact, well, we don't even start at personal branding first because personal branding is actually the effect of the solution that they bring to the table. It's actually understanding the complex problem that I can solve first and foremost. Mm. And then and then and then understanding what does that solution actually look like. And, and then how can I solve, who, who needs this problem solved? So I think that is actually the first step. So, so, so working on personal branding as in that's going to get eyeballs on my content, no, that's actually not the truth. That personal branding at a very high level is just branding, okay? My look, my feel, my tone, my voice. So that's not going to get you anywhere. But we have to actually start at understanding what is the complex problem I can solve and what does that look like as a solution and who mm. needs that solution solved. The personal branding is over and above that. That's the next layer of above, above that because the next layer above that is, okay, so let's unpack all of the attributes that make up you, unapologetically you, you know, your core, your core traits, your persona, your core values. I mean, what about your brand story, your proposition? All of that wraps around your core offering. A lot of people say, oh, I know what my, my values are. You know, my values are love and trust. And I say to people, well, actually, it's not love and trust because you don't love yourself and you don't trust yourself. So so it's not, that's, that's not your core value. You might You may think it is, but you don't live by those values. My core values are truth and freedom. I am a truth and a freedom fighter. Everything in my content, you will feel that. Everything I produce, every podcast I'm on, you can see the language I use all aligns with my core value. And this for me is fundamental, absolutely mm. critical. You read my brand story, you went to my website, it's 100% aligned to our conversation that we're having right now. So I think that there's a lot of moving parts that need to be glued together and people want a $99 solution and they try all oh, they want to try and figure it out for themselves, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that if you want to be seen as the go-to person, you have to understand how to glue it all together so you can be seen as the go-to expert. And, and then, and then, and only then after you've defined the branding, then and only then can you create a whole messaging campaign. You know, your content strategy, et cetera, cannot be done without those two moving parts implemented first. For sure. For sure. I, I was reading somewhere that somebody said, uh, and they defined um, brand better than anybody else I've ever heard. And they said, um, brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Yes. I think that's so defining that, creating that, you can create that conversation, which I think is really great. Mary, can I, can I wind back a little bit? Can I go to that first business that was yours? So after, I think, uh, after you worked with Belkin, you were the sales management and then you launched your own uh, digital marketing agency. Yeah. What was the catalyst? What made you go? That's it. I'm out. I'm, I'm ready to go about, I'm, I'm taking the world by myself. I actually, before I started my digital agency, I actually started another startup and that was being a direct competitor to Belkin. Oh, so right. when I left, it, this was actually an amazing story because I was in Belkin. I was the, I mean, I'm 
converted that business from a $4 million to a $54 million business in 48 months. It was wow. unreal. Damn. So I just, I was on fire. And so I had a meeting and I knew I, I could see so many opportunities that were missing in that business. And so I sat with my uh, the president of our company who was based out in California. And I said, I have got a solution to your problem. You know, like, here's what I'm thinking. I did a whole presentation. He loved it. He said, let's do a rollout. Let's trial this. Let's see what happens. And I said to him, I want to partner with you. I want to run this business in your business. And I want to head it up. I want to, I want to do it with you. And um, anyway, so various things happen. And it didn't eventuate. And then I just remember sitting one day and uh, what, no, actually what happened is that I was traveling so much. And I mean, like literally I was in a plane twice a week, you know, international travel. And it was a lot. Yeah. And I remember waking up this one morning and I had just blood pouring out of my eyes, my nose, my mouth. Oh my I was really scary. And so my husband called, you know, um, the ambulance, they came in. I thought I was dying. I'm like, am I dying? Am I dying? And I just had a burst, you know, vessel in my nose. Wow. But what happened is that that kind of put me out for a whole week. And I just realized in that moment, I just, I've got to change my life. This is not, this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I, re I put in my resignation and I knew that I had an opportunity that I was going to just go for. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know, I had no idea. I just resigned. And then I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take on Belkin. I'm gonna actually be their competitor. So thankfully I had some really awesome connections in uh, retail, some of Australia's largest retailers. And I sat down with the buyers and I said, listen, I wanna create your own exclusive tech peripheral range. We're gonna brand it. I'm gonna give it exclusively to you. Let, let me design it. Let me, you know, create it all and let's go for it. And they just bought into it. They were like, yeah, let's do it. So I did a major rollout in all Maya stores right across Australia. And my laptop bags were the number one best-selling laptop bags. I mean, it was just crazy. That just wow. happened so quickly. And, um, and then they had a change of management and a change of buyers. And then they were like, no, we don't want your products. We're going to stick with, you know, Beast. And I was just like, okay. And then the next logical step was for me to start my uh, my 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 digital agency specializing specifically in software. And again, I actually found a gap in the academic sector and I just went after that. I had no idea about software, by the way, nothing at all. I just saw an opportunity and I just went for it. And that was the second startup, which I had for seven years. Amazing. And then so you got bought out or you, you had a, a merger with that? I had a merger. I had a merger okay. with my second company. And that released me. So uh, January 2012, I took an entire year off. Wow. It was a sabbatical. It well, I needed that. I really fell rock bottom, like to the bottom of the bottom. I mean, I was really in a, like men, my mental health was really, really, really bad. Was it burnout? And I think ma massive burnout. Yeah. But also, well, I just realized that that's not my purpose and mission. That's my point. So if you don't understand what your purpose and mission is, you're going to hit rock bottom all the time because the soul wants you to listen. And so I took 12 months off and I had a, um, my mentor was a professor in philosophy at Oxford University. He was amazing. And he would be the person that would change my life, like literally. And so that, that sabbatical was well and truly uh, needed. If yeah. it's okay with you, I, I I want to dig a little bit deeper there because again, the, the the mental health of entrepreneurs is something that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, and along with, uh, I'm I'm just like ringing a bell every time you're talking. Along with the freedom fighter thing, for me, it's like creating the life of freedom for yourself. Just before we jump off, and if it's okay with you, you you mentioned your your mentor in this time was a an Oxford professor in psychology, professor sorry? In philosophy, 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 sorry the wrong P, philosophy, who once somebody told me that a degree in philosophy allows you to think deep thoughts about being unemployed. But the, um, but <laughs> um, how, how did somebody who has that academic background in philosophy, um, how did they help you find your purpose in that time? The thing about philosophy, especially when you're dealing with someone at the level that I was work, that I had the privilege of working with, Imagine somebody that has spent 13 years 
30 Ks down in the Vatican vault. You think about the knowledge and the wisdom that that guy knows that you wow. and I don't know. Yeah. So that's the first thing. So for me, I was very attracted to that. I'm not into self-help BS. Like I'm just not interested in that at all um, because I feel that self-help is a downward spiral. Yes, it can open the door, but it's never a solution. So I needed to open my mind. I've, I've, I've always been a big thinker. I've always been a deep thinker. And I just needed somebody to help guide me down that path because I couldn't make sense with a lot of things that I already kind of intuitively knew. And so when Mark took me on this journey, it wasn't about Mark saying, do this, read this, go here. It was about exploring it for yourself. And this is the difference between philosophy and self-help. Some of the things that I learned 10 years ago and the wisdom some of the things that i learned back then would you believe i've only just experienced wow this was the thing because he said i can't tell you how to receive this information and experience it you actually have to experience it for yourself and i can't even tell you when you're going to experience it but he said what i can tell you and this was the big drum roll moment for me he said what i can tell you is that Everything that you have experienced in your life, good, bad, ugly, high, low, trauma, whatever, don't think that you experienced it for you. You experienced it for the people that you're going to serve. And I'm like, what is he saying? Like, this is like, what? But it completely makes sense to me now. But he did one exercise with me that was a game changer. He said, what I want you to do, Mary, I want you to go and buy a journal. I said, yes, I've already got 4,000 of those. And he said, I don't want you to journal like the way you've always been journaling. You know, you're you're probably writing, you know, all these stories and stuff in there. I said, yes, that's exactly what I do. He said, oh, no. He said, the ancient Kabbalists, they didn't do that. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to do two things. First of all, I want you to unpack your story, the first 21 years of your life in first person. Write your story. I said, I can't remember what happened to me at one years old. He said, oh no, but your soul remembers. He just let it, let it, just let wow. your soul. Run. And I'm like, what, what is this? This guy's like, please, like, where is he taking me? And so it was like two or three weeks. I get my journal out. I'm like, right, today I'm going to start writing. What happened to me at zero and one and nothing would come. And there was this one night, three weeks into it, you know, it was like three o'clock in the morning and I just had this surge of inspiration. I'm like, right, i got to get up. i got to get up. i got to get up. I got my journal. I opened it and that was it. I was just writing like, wow, this is next level. And it just started pouring out. Wow. And then he taught me, Mary, when you journal, never write stuff. Always ask questions. The answer is always in the question. And I have mastered that, like literally mastered that. It has become such a big part of my life, how I teach and coach my clients. And every answer that I've ever seeked has been in that question. Mm. Every day, and I journal every day. There's not a day that goes by where I'm just sit quietly in silence and contemplation. Even if it's five minutes, it's I have to do this. And so philosophy, what it does is that it actually opens you to have, it almost gives you permission to question everything. And what I was questioning was the societal ideologies, these fake constructs that all of us have bought into, but we've never questioned. So when you start questioning all of the societal ideologies, you're going to be over here with a 1% very quickly. Mm, because you're just not fitting. And I think that's like the the definition of an entrepreneur. So this this year, this sabbatical, I had a, a a personal experience for me. I was in the center of Australian desert when it happened for me, when I realized that I was actually in control of my own life. I could actually make my own choices. I didn't have to rely on expectation. It was a it was a pivotal day for me, pivotal night, actually. Wow. Um, and to hear hear this, I guess, coming to fruition with you as well is amazing. Coming out of this year, did you did you then understand and have a path in front of you? Was that the the piece? 
Well, here's the thing. When I was in that in that transitional period, that 12 month with Mark, and I did this unpacking of my first 21 years, then I thought, oh, let me just extend it to the first 30 years. And of course, coming from a tech background, I looked at this and I'm like, I wonder if I can see patterns here. So I actually transferred a lot of that information onto an Excel spreadsheet. And I'm like, oh my God, like, whoa, I could see my life playing out in front of my eyes. The wow. things that made me happy, the things that uh, were, were traumatized me, things that made me unhappy, the, all these these aspects of myself. And then what I realized, Walt, is this. That's amazing, that, by the way. You mapped your emotional. I mapped it all out, Holy, everything that's out. That's amazing. It, and it was actually an amazing experience because I was able to see the truth. Do you see what I'm saying? So I mm -hmm. wanted to see the truth. So because of that, I then realized holy shit, we're actually looking for our purpose and mission outside of us, but actually it's inside of me. I have everything I need to be successful and to go and pursue my purpose and mission. Do you believe it took me three years to develop my system that I now teach that has evolved over the years, but, but I didn't want to just get on calls with people and go, oh, let's do some coaching. That's not my style. I, I need to show you how I can give you outcomes, results, transformation every step of the way. I want to move you to the next logical step as quickly as possible, not just have conversations with you. So it took me three years from that initial discovery of, oh, my God, like everything I need is inside of me. How do I now package this and create a solution to a problem? But the other thing, and I do want to say this on, for the people that are listening, we are, this is what I discovered, we are multifaceted human beings. We can never be a one size fits all. That is a societal ideology. Become a doctor and stick to that. Become a lawyer and that's what you're going to be. And I'm saying, no, sorry, I'm a lot of things and I need to bring that, all of that into my solution. I can't just be Mary, the sales guru over here and Mary, the software guru over here. No. Because the thing is that even my personal branding started 23 years ago when I actually 24 years ago, year 2000. That's when I came face to face with personal branding. Not two years ago, not four books, not because it's become, you know, super sexy to say, oh, I've got a personal brand. But 23 years ago, I came face to face with the power of personal branding. So all of that had to be packaged so that I can bring all of Mary to the table. So we must appreciate that we are multifaceted. That is the truth. I love it. And clearly your clients do too, because as I'm reading their testimonials, what they're talking about is, I think I read one which was specifically, it said the difference between working with other business coaches and Mary was that at the end I had actioned the steps that I needed to take and I had achieved the results, which I thought was, it's nice it's nice to hear your customers say that what yeah. you're doing is is working. I love it, Mary. You're you're um a freedom fighter. You're a rule breaker. You're a um you're a leader. You're a, you're an entrepreneurial enabler. This is this is you as a pure truth. One of the things that that's interesting for me your your conversation about wisdom currency and the continual investment to enhance the value of that currency is clear. You also mentioned um, the whole self-help world is is something that you classify as a BS. Are you are you constantly learning today? And if so, how? Like what's if if the self-help world is is classified as predominantly BS, let's let's leave a door open. Um, and your wisdom currency is something that you're valuing higher and higher and higher based on your experiences and your connections. What's your educational framework today? What do you do to, to continually evolve? I do a combination. You know, I still believe in coaching and mentoring in a really profound way. I believe that for me, if I want to learn something and get there in the shortest time possible, I invest in the people that can get me there in the shortest time possible. I do not believe in the notion of DIY. I don't like it. I'm not interested. It's time consuming. And I, I, I just, I want the knowledge that I need in that moment and I seek it. So that's the first thing. I do read a lot of different types of literature, you know, and I'm into anything to do with ancient wisdom, 
anything to do with even biblical knowledge. You know, it's interesting, you know, I come from a Greek heritage and, you know, philosophy, Greek philosophy, you know, even being interested in things like, you know, people like Alexander the Great, understanding the mindset of a person like that. My parents come from that region where Alexander the Great came from. So I have a really interest in that. I like to read about biblical principles, not because of religion, but because there's a lot of truth in in between the when you read in between the lines. And I kind of like to decode that. Um and I think most importantly, Walt, I trust my inner knowing. And this is where my journaling comes in. And I and when I'm asking questions and I'm trying to find answers, I'm always, always guaranteed directed in the right direction. Always, mm-hmm. always. It's never let me down, put it that way, which is why I believe in it so much. So I'm a combination of, but I do not read self-help books at all, at all. I have no interest in them whatsoever. I'm, I am really anti-self-help. I don't mind if people read it as a door opener and, you know, that's like they can see the crack in the door and they walk through, but you've got to go deeper. For me, everything starts inside myself. So I do a lot of internal shadow work. I really come face to face with my fears. I'm not afraid to see that truth in myself where I have weaknesses, where I'm not seeing, where where I'm choosing not to see. And I can ask those, you know, those difficult questions and and go there, you know, because we're not all perfect. I don't know everything. And and I don't want to know everything. I want to keep learning to know everything. And I just don't think that we ever, ever leave this world knowing everything. But I think you have to have an appetite to want to know as much as you can because the more we know and the more we unfold, the more we move away from that 99% and we come over this way. Amazing. Amazing. Everything you already, or everything you need is already inside you. Um, so just un- getting to know yourself and understanding who you are and recognizing that that's enough. I often tell my daughter, um, she's 13 as I'm recording this, um, struggling with self-confidence a little bit, looking in the mirror saying, just make sure you're connecting and say to yourself, I'm okay. I'm actually, I'm okay. This, like for me, the realization in the same way, everything you have is who you're supposed to be. It's everything you need. You've got it. You've got that whole package. It's there right there. All you need is to feel comfortable with who you are and be able to move that forward. Incredible. So do you have, you mentioned that um, working with mentors and coaches is something that that you are a, a big advocate of. Do you have a mentor and coach right now? Is it, are you working with somebody no, in a formal arrangement? Okay. If you were no. your own coach, what would you say to yourself? Um. I think that I'm going to stick to that whole idea of that self-belief is where it starts, like just constantly challenging yourself, go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I do a lot of this, this work more now than ever before. The other thing that I'm getting really into now is, and, and, and knowledge is one thing, but also our physiology is another thing. And I think that this is very, very important. So for me, it's not so much around having a coach, but right now I'm really focused on, you know, nurturing my body, my nervous system. So I have a physio that specializes in this area and I'm with him every single week because I really need to nurture my body and really bring down that 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 fight and flight as much as I possibly can. I'm a fairly grounded person, but but really, really looking after my body and, and nurturing that is where my focus is right at this point. And I think we have to do that. We, have, we can't do it all, well, we can, but what I'm saying is that for me, my priority at the moment is my physiology. It's really critical. And then, you know, who knows what will happen, you know, in two months from now. I'm not surprised, by the way. I'm, I'm really not surprised. I said to you before we started recording that making you look good would be easy for me. I think I'm not surprised just purely because you, you've you done that journey of um, philosophical understanding of who you are and, and where you're headed and, you know, the pathway that's there and, and the um, emotional wisdom, the wisdom currency, as you're calling it. I'm not surprised now that you've ventured into the physical to understand that as well and get a great understanding of the whole picture and yeah. make sure that, you know, there's so many different facets of that, that, um, that you can call on. Um, this to me is a, a, a true guiding, um, conversation, you and I, I think I'm hoping that as people are listening to this, they're recognizing that 
A, it's okay to be me. A, B, it doesn't matter if I believe it strongly enough, then I can make something happen all this, all this way down the path. Um, I hope people are understanding that if you're in a dark place, there's light and it's been achieved and it's definitely something that you can walk towards. As I look at um, maryhendersoncoaching.com and I look at uh, people being able to find you on Instagram and um, Facebook and LinkedIn especially, um, where will we see you and your uh, influence and your, your touch points in the world? Where will we see you over the next 12 months? I think that I'm going to really amplify my presence across LinkedIn. I think that LinkedIn is such a major opportunity for so many entrepreneurs, especially when you think that there's only 1 billion uh, users on LinkedIn and only 3% of those users are creating content. Mm. I would say that 80% of the content is pretty average. So there's major, major opportunity there for all of us, all of us. And, and, and we have to think like that. There's a, there's, there's, there's a tribe that I believe is dedicated to every single one of us, you know, because the whole point is to share our wisdom, isn't it? You know, so so I think that for me, I'm really, really focused on amplifying my presence uh, on LinkedIn, and but very strategically and deliberately, Walt. Not just for anyone. I'm not. I am not a one size fits all, and that's exactly the way I want it to be. Because when you have that mindset, and I hope that everyone takes a, a page out of my book, when you have a mindset that I am not for everyone, but I, but I am for these people only serve those people. I call them your 10%. Don't worry about the 90%. The 90% are not loyal. They don't care about you. They never will advocate for you. Let them go. It's the 10% that you want to focus on. And that's where I'm at. I love it. I love it. And for those who just heard that and went, oh, I can just spam the crap out of LinkedIn. That's not what Mary's saying. And in fact, okay. if you want to know what Mary's saying, come over to LinkedIn, just uh, type in Mary Henderson. We'll make sure that the, the links are all the way through our show notes, and et cetera, because you will see the absolute clear example of what Mary's talking about, being yourself and authenticity comes with the very nature of who you are and what you're doing. Don't try and copy anybody else's. Don't copy and paste content. Worst thing you can possibly do. Oh. Be yourself because people just cannot wait to hear from you. And again, like look at the example set by Mary, um, being yourself and holding true to that that North Star message that you have has led you to become a leader. As you said, four books where you've got coaching systems set up and ready to go. Guys, if you want to follow anybody, come across and, and learn from Mary. I'm just going to say from, from our community, from, um, from myself personally, thank you for the time. Amazing to actually um, be able to sit with you for an hour or so and talk about how entrepreneurs, how startup founders, side hustlers, salespeople, how we can all find that true North within ourselves understand that we do have a voice and we have that wisdom currency inside of us and taking that out into the marketplace is exactly what we should be doing. So I want to say thank you for, from our listeners and for myself. Um, I cannot wait to see what their future's got in, in store for you. Do come back and check with us and tell us what's going on because we'd love to hear it, Mary. You're, you're a real pleasure Thanks, to have Bob. on. Thank you so much, Walt. I really appreciate it. Awesome to see you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Mary Henderson, I will make sure that you've got that link in the show notes. It's maryhendersoncoaching.com. And again, if you want to follow a true leader in the space of personal branding, in the in the um, space of finding your own voice and being able to present that to the world, there's nobody better out there. Mary, again, thank you so much. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.